The day after the Major League Baseball trade deadline. Plenty to get to here in hour number two of the morning after, live on this Wednesday on Sports Grid. Sirius XM Channel 159, the home for Sports Grid Radio on Sirius XM and all across the Sports Grid network. I am Ben Stevens. Of course, the blockbuster deal of yesterday, ahead of the 6 p.m. Eastern time deadline, was Juan Soto being dealt from the Washington Nationals to the San Diego Padres, an immediate market mover that will have ramifications throughout the National League the rest of this Major League Baseball season. But elsewhere around the bigs, a couple of deals to recap for you as well. We told you Eric Hosmer in that initial transaction said, I'm not going to play for Washington for the worst team in the league in the Nats. He gets dealt to the Boston Red Sox instead. Luke Voigt goes in his place back to Washington to finalize that deal. Joey Gallo, now a Los Angeles Dodger as well. And the Phillies making some small moves throughout the Major League Baseball trade deadline yesterday. They add Noah Syndergaard from the Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim. David Robertson, a veteran relief pitcher from Chicago. And Brandon Marsh from those LA Angels as well. The Phillies are pretty far back of the Mets right now in the National League East. The Phils get underway with some day baseball on the day following the deadline in just a couple of hours to start off your Wednesday in a divisional matchup against those Atlanta Braves in Atlanta. A really good pitching duel between Zach Wheeler and Charlie Morton, as you can see there. Good luck, Chuck, and the Braves, a minus 136 home favorite at the moment. And I mentioned the Phillies are pretty far back of the Mets at the top of the National League East, but the Phillies currently occupy that third and final National League wild card spot. So when Philly starts to deal a little bit, they are making those moves to be a postseason contender, to find their way into October baseball, and then anything can happen. The Mets yesterday had a huge day in Washington, D.C. The Mets still own a three-and-a-half game lead in the National League East over the Atlanta Braves. They have a 10-game advantage over the Philadelphia Phillies as well. And as you can see, a hefty favorite to win that division at minus 250. I mentioned it was a significant day for the New York Mets on deadline day. Why? Well, it wasn't an acquisition per se. It was the return of Jacob DeGrom, his season debut, pitching for the first time on the bump in more than a year for the Amazons. And as we have seen, unfortunately, for Mets backers and Mets fans many a time in the past three, four seasons for the Mets, it was a stellar outing for Jacob DeGrom in his return, but it resulted in in a Mets loss. In fact, New York was booked as a minus 350 road favorite against the Nats yesterday on deadline day when they shipped away Soto and Josh Bell as well. And they still win as a huge plus money, money line underdog. Let's go back to the stats on Jacob DeGrom there to fully break down what we saw out of Jake yesterday. Five innings of work, only 59 pitches. Of course, the Mets are going to be very cautious with Jacob DeGrom in his early return, but only allowed one earned run on three hits. Had six strikeouts and only 59 pitches, but did fall short of going over that K prop at six and a half. So a big return for Jacob DeGrom and the New York Mets. A minus 250 favorite in the National League East with a three and a half game lead over the Atlanta Braves and still booked with the second best price to win the National League pennant at plus 290. The Dodgers are the favorites at plus 165 and the Mets still ahead of the Padres Despite San Diego now having Juan Soto as a part of their lineup, the Padres the third best price at plus 490. Quickly, a welcome to our Sports Grid Radio audience here. The second hour of the morning after live on this Wednesday. Sirius XM, Channel 159, all of our terrestrial radio affiliates as well. I am Ben Stevens. So a divisional duel for the Phils and the Braves today. Both of those teams in the National League wildcard picture right now. The Braves the top spot, the Phillies the final spot. Another divisional duel with some day baseball on the day after the MLB trade deadline. This one in the American League East between the Blue Jays and the Rays. Toronto making a move yesterday to acquire Whit Merrifield from the Kansas City Royals. Whit Merrifield unvaccinated at the moment, but of course, if you play up in the Great White North, you need to be vaccinated. Whit Merrifield said that if he played for a contender, he would probably get the COVID-19 vaccine. You almost can expect that to be the case now as a member of the Blue Jays. And as you can see, Toronto a slight road favorite at the moment against the Rays today, who are at home at minus 106 
on that money line. And some of those small moves that we often see from Toronto, from Tampa, especially ahead of the trade deadline, positions both of these teams to be in the hunt for those American League wildcard spots right now. The Blue Jays occupy the top spot in the AL wildcard race. The Blue Jays' odds to win the American League East, 35-1 to 1 at the moment, the second best price as they sit in second, but still 12 full games behind the Yankees. The Rays are 15 games behind the pinstripes. Their price to win the American League East, 5,000 to 1. But focus on those pennant odds because that's the story for the Blue Jays and the Rays right now as they are both teams if the season ended today, which it does not. But if it ended today, the Blue Jays and the Rays would be in that American League wild card. The Blue Jays occupy the top spot. Then the Mariners, who got a victory up in the Bronx over the Yankees yesterday. And then the Rays have that third and final spot. The Guardians trail by a game. The Baltimore Orioles still a game and a half out of postseason contention. The Blue Jays have the third best price in the American League pennant, plus 700. The Rays are 30 to 1. Tampa, the two-time defending top spot in the American League postseason picture. Plenty more to get to after the Major League Baseball trade deadline later in this hour, but NFL news up next. Sports Grid. Your 24-7 sports wagering network. They play less games. The early line. Take a look at the top four seeds here in the Big Ten. They're going to play Aaron less Rogers and The morning the after. Wilson. We saw movement in the marketplace like Orlando. Fantasy Magic. Sports the Today. The Cavaliers are a little thin as well. Newswire. Minus 160 favorite on the money line today for Arizona. Pharrell coast the to BBG, coast. That's where they win cups. They win Stanley Cups over there. Give me the Game penalty. time decision. Kind of bizarre when you consider like the, everybody is out for the Warriors. In game live all like access. Mandy. I like Vandy against Bam. I think Vandy can win the game, take a four and a half. In game oh, live man. prime oh, time. The major, the PGA champion. In yes. game live overtime. All done before the final bet. Get begins. the winning edge only on Sports Grid. The Bostonian versus the book. And again, you're just building pieces right now, and you have the benefit of having a pretty nice lead, but the Astros are right there trying to get that one seed. That one seed is gigantic. i got to give baseball credit. They changed that to give the one seed a buy. Now you don't have to play that first-round scary three-game series, and you can set up your pitching rotation however you want with home field advantage throughout. Mm -hmm. It's huge. The Bostonian versus the book. Pharrell, coast to coast. On Odo, going to Ugh. the Padres. Look out, a massive deal. Josh Bell would probably be the number two guy on the market in terms of a power hitter that was available. Go figure, he moves to San Diego along with Soto. At 23, the most dangerous man in baseball with the most dangerous lethal bat in baseball. The Sports Grid Network. Sports professor Rick Haro on Southern 1.3 trillion dollar business of sports with your daily numbers game. Gambling and the NFL, well, it's preseason, Gillette Stadium, but everybody is fit in the same process. How to generate more and more revenue. Remember the TV deal through 2032 at the NFL level, $111 billion, about $330 million per team. Imagine getting a check in the mail for $330 million. I can't, but league owners can, certainly. Gambling gonna be a major part of that. 90% of all of us will be able to gamble remotely by 2025, a Pricewaterhouse Cooper study. And most important for the next generation, the 12 to 17 year olds, 97% say they're sports fans. How? Keep them interested, competitive products and gambling down the road. Certainly, this is a step in the next direction and certainly the NFL has cornered the market. Sports professor Rick Haro, Daily Numbers.
Back right here on the morning after on Sports Grid, Sirius XM, Channel 159, all across the Sports Grid network as well. I am Ben Stevens. Training camp in the NFL into its second week. You'll hear me say this a ton. We have a football game tomorrow. Yes, a preseason game, but still a football game on the actual gridiron. The Hall of Fame game in Canton, Ohio, between the Jaguars and the Raiders. Well, the full breakdown of that preseason affair tomorrow. But as we get ready to go through training camp here, the offseason is done. It's the preseason. It's training camp time across the National Football League. Let's take a renewed look at those individual award odds available on the FanDuel Sportsbook. And one of my favorites to look at, because all of the prices are relatively long, especially in comparison to one another, is NFL Coach of the Year. And look who's at the top of the board for a second straight season. That would be the head man of the LA Chargers, Brandon Staley. He was the favorite last year, entering the 2021 NFL season. He is the favorite in 2022. This time a co-favorite at 14-1 to alongside the New York Giants head coach, the new man in New York, Brian Dable. Then you'll see a run of coaches there with a 16-1 to price. Kevin O'Connell, new head coach in Minnesota. Doug Peterson, new head coach, but a Super Bowl champion as well. He's the new head man in Duval County for the Jaguars. Dan Campbell, who we'll get to in just a moment. Nathaniel Hackett, the new head coach in Denver. Four coaches, all at 16-1, to only $2 behind the co-favorites of Brandon Staley and Brian Dable at 14-1. to here is the history, the trends you need to know, at least in the last five years, for finding your best bet for NFL Coach of the Year. All five of the most recent winners have won or, or have led their team, who have won this award, have led their team to the postseason. Let me say that again. All five of the most recent winners of the NFL Coach of the Year have led their team to the playoffs. Three of those five were first-year head coaches. Sean McVay, Matt Nagy, And a name I'm forgetting here as well, Kevin Stefanski. Those are the three of the five. So the last five winners of NFL Coach of the Year have led their team to the playoffs. You should know that and how you evaluate head coaches. Brian Dable in his first year in New York. If the Giants, who have a win total around seven, win seven games but miss the playoffs, probably not going to do enough for the voters as it pertains to Coach of the Year. The same could be said for Kevin O'Connell or Doug Peterson. If Doug Peterson leads the Jags to seven wins over their win total of six and a half and Trevor Lawrence looks outstanding in his sophomore season, that's great from maybe that value perspective and the optimism for the future of the Jags, but it doesn't necessarily result in a Coach of the Year award for Doug Peterson. Last year, it was Mike Vrabel of the Tennessee Titans leading his team to the top spot in the AFC postseason picture. So how about the optimism for the Detroit Lions and their second-year head coach, in Dan Campbell well at the very least if he doesn't win the coach of the year award he's going to fire all of us up on his way throughout the 2022 season what are we what makes us what we are and what we're going to be it's our core foundation man grit and what does it mean in a nutshell I think it means this we'll go a little bit longer we'll push a little harder and we'll think a little deeper and a little sharper these were unbreakable. Like to me, it means we'll play anywhere. We'll play on grass. We'll play in turf. We'll go to landfill. Doesn't matter. And that's what we got to be. That's who we have to be. Because we'll tread water as long as it takes to f- bury you. Let's go to work, man. It's about to be fun. O and D. If you're not fired up right now, please check your pulse. That an excerpt from HBO's Hard Knocks. Of course, the Detroit Lions will be the focus of the training camp and preseason Hard Knocks. It starts in just under a week. Next Tuesday, we'll play on grass. We'll play on turf. We'll go to a landfill. Dan Campbell is willing to bring your opponent to garbage to play you on the football field. That should say all you need to know about the mentality of the Detroit Lions. Dan Campbell is a walking soundbite. Of course, last year in his introductory press conference, he mentioned biting his opponent's kneecaps. Well, the Lions might be biting some kneecaps this year. Dan Campbell, 16 to 1, tied for the third best price to win NFL Coach of the Year. But put that into context with his team's success. A win total for the Lions this year 
at six and a half. The over has the juice at minus 125. But to make the postseason and each of the last five winners of the Coach of the Year award have reached the playoffs is plus 410. A long shot price on the Lions out of the NFC. So if Dan Campbell and Detroit win seven games going over that win total, does it mean despite how many sound bites Dan Campbell might give us throughout this 2022 NFL campaign and how much hard knocks bump he might get, does it mean he's going to win coach of the year? Not necessarily, but you can tell the optimism for the Lions. They buy in to what their head coach says. They sing his praises. The Detroit Lions last year, booked as an underdog in all 17 regular season games in 2021, 11-6 against the number. The third best cover percentage in the NFL the hope is you turn some of those competitive covers in games that you kept close to wins the following year I believe the Lions will go over six and a half wins and maybe if they can be in the hunt for the postseason Dan Campbell has some value at 16 to 1 to win coach of the year and a lot of that value and a lot of that optimism for Detroit comes from their young talented roster especially defensively in the number two overall pick in this past year's draft Aiden Hutchinson, the edge rusher out of Michigan. Aiden Hutchinson is one of the betting favorites right now to an NFL defensive rookie of the year. He is tied alongside Kayvon Thibodeau, another rookie edge rusher who was the fifth overall pick for the New York Giants. Both Thibodeau and Hutchinson, six to one. The third best number is Trayvon Walker, the number one overall pick, an edge rusher out of Georgia now for the Jacksonville Jaguars. Kyle Hamilton there, a safety for the Baltimore Ravens at 10 to 1. And again, the historic trends of knowing what you are betting for defensive rookie of the year. The last three winners of this award have all played on the defensive line or been an edge rusher if you include Micah Parsons, who won the award last year. Technically listed as a linebacker, but he won the award because he had 13 sacks in his rookie campaign for the Cowboys last year. Six of the last nine winners of defensive rookie of the year all on that D-line. That's why you see three of the best odds being defensive linemen. Kayvon Thibodeau, Aiden Hutchinson, and Trayvon Walker, which leads us to Defensive Player of the Year as well, where D-linemen win this award more times than not. Seven of the last eight have played on that defensive front. Three of the last five have been one man. Yes, that would be Aaron Donald, who probably could win Defensive Player of the Year every year. He has that much of an impact throughout the entirety of an NFL football game. But last year, it was T.J. Watt of the Pittsburgh Steelers. Of course, T.J. Watt led the league in each of the last two years in sacks, 15 in 2020, 22 and a half last year in 2021. He has also led the NFL, has T.J. Watt, in each of the last two seasons in tackle for loss, 23 in 2021, 21 last year. But he has the second best price this year to an NFL Defensive Player of the Year. The favorite right now is Miles Garrett at plus 700. You heard from Matt Fontana of ESPN Cleveland yesterday mentioning the talent on the defensive side of the football for the Browns this year and how Miles Garrett just wants one single vote for Defensive Player of the Year, something he has not received as of yet. Miles Garrett, in terms of sack production the last couple of seasons, a career high 16 sacks last year in 2020, uh, 2021 rather, double digits each of the last four years a first team all pro for miles garrett each of the last two seasons and miles garrett as we correlate markets if you're going to lead the league in sacks and you play d line you have a very good chance of winning the nfl defensive player of the year award and miles garrett right now is booked as the favorite not just to win nfl dpoy but to lead the league in sacks on FanDuel at plus 600 a career high 16 a season ago but still six and a half back of T.J. Watt, who led the league last year with 22 and a half. Aaron Donald, by the way, has averaged 12.8 sacks each of the last three seasons. We flip our focus from the NFL to the regular season finale on the PGA Tour with Cam Rogers up next. Your heart's racing. The clock's running out. It all comes down to this. We're talking pregame. 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 Get locked in with game time decisions. 
your hosts, Gabe Marinci and Cam Stewart, will get you ready for game time. Everything you need to know before a game goes off the board with the best lips to back it up. Make your best bet with live odds updates, late breaking news, up to the minute injury reports, and real time analytics from inside the sports books. All the odds, all the action from sports wagering insiders and industry pros like Donnie Wrightside, Cam Lou, Cousin Sal, the pro football doc, Dr. David Chow, and more. Get the winning edge every weekday afternoon from 6 to 7 p.m. Eastern, 3 to 4 Pacific. It's game time decisions only on Sports Grid. Pro Football Doc has found its new home right here with Sports Injury Central. And with that comes our expansion into other sports. Sports Injury Central will give you nonstop exclusive injury analysis from experienced team doctors from all three major sports. Doctors with resumes that include teams like the Chicago Bulls, the Texas Rangers, and the LA Chargers. So gain a fantasy DFS and betting edge right now for free at SICscore.com. The early line. We talked about it a lot yesterday, Kevin. What would that have looked like? What was a trade piece going to be? And can you imagine if, let's just say, they had to give up three of their top four prospects, but you got Otani at the deadline? My goodness, if you want to talk about back page in New York City and owning the tabloids for the rest of the summer, that would have been sensational to watch. But even there, the Yankees, the best team in baseball record-wise, added on and got a pretty good troop back here yesterday to sort of move forward. And maybe they're not done yet. Only on Sports Grid. The morning after. What's the atmosphere like for sports betting in Massachusetts right now? My first reaction was, it's about damn time. My second reaction was, is this real? Because it also happened at like 6, 7 a.m. in the morning. I was watching it until I went to bed that night because once 3 a.m. hit, I said, okay, I'm going to trust the process here. I'm going to set an early alarm anyway. The lawmakers, the decision makers, the legislators, the people that beat got this right for Massachusetts. The Sports Grid Network. Pharrell, coast to coast. On Soto, going to Ugh. the Padres. Look out, a massive deal. Josh Bell would probably be the number two guy on the market in terms of a power hitter that was available. Go figure, he moves to San Diego along with Soto at 23, the most dangerous man in baseball with the most dangerous lethal bat in baseball. The Sports Grid Network. Playoffs? Playoffs. That's next week on the PGA Tour. This week, the regular season finale, the Wyndham Championship, before the FedEx Cup playoffs begin. So, of course, as we round out the regular year, we need the expertise. One final time for regular season PGA Tour events from our golf expert. That would be Cam Rogers, the host of the Lock It In podcast for Believe, joining us here on this Wednesday on the morning after on Sports Grid. Cam? The end of the regular season on the PGA Tour. Has anything happened this year in golf? Jeez. No, nah, not really, Ben. <laughs> Good to be with you, sir. Excited for Sedgefield here this week. Different golf course, different way I'm handicapping here. By the way, this is the last chance for the guys on the bubble, right, to get into the playoffs. Right. Real quick here, the data shows that if you are on that bubble, that does not lend you to actually perform well at the Wyndham Championship. Typically, those players play poorly. So don't bet on the guys who are on the bubble just based off of motivation, all right? Keep that in mind. A great handicapping tip that changes the outlook for the Wyndham Championship. Normally, we're picking outright winners, the best in the field trying to finish within the top five, top ten. But you have to pay attention to the guys just trying to make the weekend to get a couple of more FedEx Cup points to see the postseason as well. But before we dive in to the Wyndham Championship, the last two weeks on the PGA Tour have been owned by one man. Tony Finau, first the 3M Open, then the Rocket Mortgage Classic last week. Back-to-back titles for Tony Finau. And Cam, I want to read out this quote from Tony, one of the great guys on the PGA Tour, who said, quote, they say a winner is just a loser that kept on trying, and that's me to a T. How many times do I lose? But one thing I won't do is give up, and I'm only here as a winner because I chose not to give up and just kept 
going. End quote from Tony Finau. How would you describe, Cam, what you have seen out of Finau these past two weeks on tour? You know the saying, right? Michael Jordan getting cut from his high school freshman team and then, of course, goes on to potentially be the GOAT of the NBA. So really is amazing stuff from Tony Finau here. He showed some signs earlier this year, especially with the ball striking, that he was coming close to actually winning on the PGA Tour. But winning back-to-back, that is very, very rare. And really, that is a testament to the depth of the PGA Tour that we have. Week in and week out, you're seeing first-time winners break through and all this stuff. So for Tony to do it twice in a row, and really what's more impressive, Ben, is he took no breaks in between. Like, this wasn't a win, and then he took a couple weeks off and then won again. He won right after the Rocket Mortgage Classic, after that victory. Remember last week when I was like, eh, the value is more in him missing the cut. He's probably <laughs> partying, hung over on Monday and Tuesday. Well, I couldn't be more wrong about that because he just carried that momentum over. And sometimes you'll see that with the elite golfers on the PGA Tour. And Tony Fino sometimes gets that bad rap of, oh, he doesn't win enough. His talent is way higher than what he's actually producing. Well, now he's producing, and I think he's going to win a major yeah. championship at some point down the line. He's too good of a player. Really impressive stuff. He was partying on Sunday night when he and his family returned to Salt Lake City and were met with a hero's welcome at the airport. Shout out to Tony Fina, who also said following his round last Sunday at the Rocket Mortgage Classic in Detroit, he's glad his family can be there, that his kids can see him fail but rise up again and win championships. you got to feel good for a guy like that. Tony Finau not in the field this week at the regular season finale on the PGA Tour, the Wyndham Championship. Cam, you mentioned it's an interesting handicap given it is the finale and guys are just trying to boost their position for the FedEx Cup playoffs. So with that being said, how do you evaluate this field that doesn't necessarily have the most household names in it? Yeah, absolutely. And listen, I would say 95% of the time I am weighing driving distance higher than driving accuracy. Here's that 5% where I'm really weighing heavily on driving accuracy this week. Sedgefield's Country Club, forget about the driver. It's about hitting fairways. And you look at the past winners here, Ben. Putting strategist, Kevin Kisner in 2021. Jim Herman in 2020, great putter. JT Poston, same thing, 2019. Brant Snedeker, 2018. Like, typically on the PGA Tour, you see a mixture of different winners, bombers, shorter hitters. This is very clear. The data shows it's all about your short approach shots and your putting here at Sedgefield Country Club. So with that said, I'm not really keying in on driving distance or really elite around the green game, short iron play and putting. And that lends me to believe that J.H. Kim at 32 to one, he's just off the board here as you see on your screen Mm. as the winner here this week. He leads the field in strokes gained total over the last six events, gained seven strokes on ball striking last week at the Rockets Rocket Mortgage Classic, finished seventh at that tournament, sixth in this field in driving accuracy. I think it could be his time here to win on the PGA Tour. I could see him breaking through this week. Also some value potentially on Denny McCarthy. And Cam, we'll get to who you think has a good week in this field, which we normally do, the top 10 and top 20 finishing positions. I want to focus on top 30 for a second because you'll see those favorites like Shane Lowry, like Will Zalatoris, have a hefty, minus money price we're not necessarily taking the value because there isn't any on those guys but can you reiterate what you shared at the very start of this segment about those guys in the field looking just to see a postseason spot in the FedEx Cup playoffs and how that handicap changes in their games who do you expect that's on the outside right now looking in to make a run this week at the Wyndham Championship Right. So what I talked about here at the top of the segment here, Ben, is that you should not bet on a player just because that player is on the bubble to get into the playoffs. Listen, there's a reason why they're on the bubble. It's because they haven't been playing that great so far this year, or at least they haven't been all that consistent. So you have to really pick and choose here when you're looking at these numbers in terms of the top 30 finishers here this week. Listen, I would give Stuart Sink a look here at plus 290. We're talking about a guy who Won twice on the PGA Tour last year. Went all the way to East Lake, of course, the Tour Championship last year. Really interesting to see that he's actually potentially not going to make the playoffs here this year. Yeah. Of course, he hasn't won, but he's a guy who can certainly perform well here at Sedgefield. Again, driving distance, not that key. He's a good short iron player. He's somebody who should perform well at this golf course. Somebody like an Austin Smotherman at plus 350, he's shown some signs 
here in this PGA Tour season, certainly of late, too. Plus 350 is a really good number for a top 30. He's going to need more than that, you would think, to feel comfortable getting yeah. in to the playoffs and make it a deep run. But, yeah, those are two names I'm looking at. But, again, don't just look at the FedEx Cup standings and be like, oh, okay, 127. He has to play hard, right? You can't really quantify motivation in this regard, so it's tough. Certainly so. Motivation can be a solid handicapping tool at times, but there's also a reason those players need motivation. Right. They haven't had the best PGA Tour regular season, and that's why they're on the outside looking in at this moment. A brilliant piece of handicapping advice in any sport, but for this week's Wyndham Championship from Cam Rogers. All right, so maybe we're not looking at the guys on the outside trying to make their way into the FedEx Cup postseason, but Cam, who do you expect to have a good week at the Wyndham Championship, finishing within that top 10 or top 20? Yeah, let's go to the top 10s. This might as well be the Webb Simpson Open, Ben. I mean, he's been absolutely What's his daughter's name? This tournament. Wyndham. You knew I was going to say that. I mean, everybody's talking about it. Yeah, he named his daughter Wyndham, of course, after the Wyndham Championship. Leads the field in strokes game total at this event over the last five years by over 30 strokes. That's absolutely ridiculous. Webb Simpson, plus 190. Top 10, forget about it. Adam Long is 6-1 to one for a top 10, but I can see it happening here this week. He's just been so steady. Four straight top 25 finishes, 15th in strokes gained approach over the last 24 rounds. Great par four scorer as well. Decent driver of the golf ball, so keep an eye on him for a top 10. And then even longer than that, plus 650, Kevin Streelman. He was seventh here last year. Runner up at the Barbasol Championship not too long ago. Similar field strength, if you will, at that tournament. 16th in strokes gained tee to green. Over the last 24 rounds, super accurate driver, too. Again, that's a key stat for me here this week. So, of course, Streelman, Long, Webb Simpson, those are my top 10 plays. And now the top 20s because we're rolling through the finishing positions here on the morning after. Cam, who do you like to have a really good week as well at the Wyndham Championship? Yeah, let's look at Brian Harmon here. Listen, you don't love the number at plus 160, but I think it's free money. He was 10th at the Travelers, 6th at the Open Championship, 6th at Sedgefield back in 2019. Great Bermuda putter. That's key for me this week as well. 12th in this field in driving accuracy. So go ahead and bet that number. Adam Spenson, I can't get off this guy. He was top 25 last week, riding a hot putter, hot iron game. 15th in a uh, top 15 in strokes game total over the last 24 rounds. Great short iron player in particular as well. That's key for me. And then the South African, Christian Bezatenhu, plus 230. Really good number here. I think this is a good course for him. Runner up at the John Deere a few weeks ago. Seventh in this field in strokes game putting over the last 24 rounds. Scrambling and short game is electric. So keep an eye on Christian Bezatenhu there for a top 20. Cam, will you be evaluating anything in this field this week that will give you a sense of how those golfers might perform come FedEx Cup playoff time? Yeah, I'm not going to put a lot of stock into it. I think if you make a big leap from outside the top 125 inside and making it into the playoffs, maybe I'll put some stock into that in terms of motivation and momentum. Obviously, momentum is a thing right now with Tony Fino, so maybe it will be for somebody else too here. So keep an eye on that. We head to Memphis next week, Ben. Should be a really fun tournament. Then we, of course, go up the eastern seaboard a little bit for the rest of the playoffs, back down to East Lake for the Tour Championship. So it's going to be a lot of fun. We're getting ready for new seasons to begin in football here in the month of August. The NFL, college football on the horizon later in this month as well. It's postseason time, playoff time in the world of golf. The PGA Tour, the final regular season event at the Wyndham Championship. And then Cam, your focus all on the playoffs. Cam Rogers, the host of the Lock It In podcast for Believe, as always. We appreciate you being here with us all regular season long, soon to be in the playoffs as well. I can't believe we're already here, Ben. I'm like shedding tears right now because we're already at the playoffs. Thanks for the time. Bittersweet. Tears of joy, I hope, at the very least. And a home stretch for Major League Baseball. Up next, the pitching ninja, Rob Freeman, joins the show. Sports Grid, your 24-7 sports wagering network.
people are going to the betting window betting and betting them the now rim. before the trade takes place. How Diamond dare they bets. do what's fiscally responsible? See how it plays out. Buffalo's going all in right Football now. Football full need. circle. All their chips in the middle of the table. It's do or die for And them. Godwin being out. They, they've had a little bit of a shakeup. In-game live all access. You could take the points. You could take the money line. And we had to go to San Jose, too. Maybe a small play on San Jose. I'm going to go both underdogs here. I don't want to hear it anymore. Wow. In game live. Prime time. He plays time. like he did in game five. They are going to be all good in game six at home. But boy, you want to give the eight and a half points with a desperate team facing elimination. Get the winning edge. Only on Sports Grid, your 24 7 sports wagering network. The morning after. Georgie, what was your reaction to this law getting legalized? Took longer than it should have. The state lost out on a lot of money, but now no more do people need to go over, drive over to the states and the borders that are surround Massachusetts and shoot. I can go to Encore Casino with their beautiful sports book and have fun there. Watching games like I did for the Big Ten football championship last year. And also at the same wow. time, hey, bet prop bets. The Sports Grid Network. Fantasy Sports Today. Uh, I, I've just played my narrative for the under nine and a half. I suppose we should play the over for nine and a half. The reason why it would be set at nine and a half is one, I think some people are wagering that Sean Watson doesn't miss any time, right? You know, there would people be out there who say, look, if Watson's camp is appealing to get it down to zero games, then there's a chance that, you know, the Browns become like a 12 win team. The Sports Grid Network. Pharrell, coast to coast. I think the Yankees did really nicely at the deadline, to be honest with you. I did too. The one that did not move the needle a little bit for me was the Montas deal. It's not a bad pickup by any stretch of the imagination, but I have a little bit of concerns about his shoulder going forward. He's already been on the IL a couple of times, and this is a team that desperately needs not just a starter, but a starter that will remain on the field for the rest of the year. It can't be Garrett Cole all year long. Nestor Cortez has hit a couple of snags. The Sports Grid Network. Today is the day after the day in Major League Baseball. Yesterday was the trade deadline across the bigs. Today, it's the start of the home stretch of the Major League Baseball season. The rosters are finalized. You know who you got in your clubhouse to make that playoff push. We go around Major League Baseball on this Wednesday, live right here on the morning after. The man that reminds us constantly how hard it is to be a batter in the bigs, that would be the pitching ninja. Rob Friedman from FanDuel joins the show right now. Rob, so many moves yesterday ahead of the Major League Baseball trade deadline. How was your day? How's your head feeling? Is it spinning with everything that you saw? Dude, I, I try so hard to keep up with the actual games that are being played that is so tough to keep up with all these trades. Like, I know the big ones, right. but I'm still processing all this stuff. You have Castillo going today for the, for the Mariners. Like, come on. Right. It is so interesting because it's the games that were also played yesterday and some pretty significant matchups at that and then obviously some blockbuster deals. And we'll start with a few of those huge trade news that we saw yesterday, Rob. And of course, Juan Soto being dealt from the Washington Nationals, now a San Diego Padre. A 23-year-old superstar sensation, Rob, now in San Diego. At the deadline, how do you describe the significance of this trade happening when it did oh i mean it's a it's a earthquake in baseball it is an absolutely huge deal soto is one of those guys that i enjoy even as a pitching guy i enjoy watching him because every at bat against that dude is a chess match he makes every pitch count he works the count he draws walks he's a competitor he's fun to watch like 
he's a fun guy even as a pitching guy and then in return you know mckenzie gore is a pretty solid young pitcher yeah. like at the beginning of the year i thought he was going to have a monster season this year so they got some good pieces in return but yep. yeah i mean that's a it's a big deal a big prospect haul for the nationals as well some guys that already have major league experience a good deal for them and of course a great deal for san diego 23 years old that's all Juan Soto is. He has already walked at the plate more than 460 times in his five-year Major League Baseball career. Rob, a pitching guy, can appreciate patience at the dish as well. Juan Soto leading the bigs this year in walks at the plate. So we know, Rob, that he was an immediate market mover, that being Juan Soto, Juan Soto excuse me, plus 850 for the Padres before the deal, now plus 490 to win the National League pennant. And those odds to win the World Series cut exactly in half pre and post Juan Soto trade. Rob, how do you evaluate San Diego right now? Do you put them on the same peg as we begin here in the month of August with the Dodgers and with the Mets? I think you have to. I th adding a guy like that just makes the entire lineup better. I mean, you're adding one of the most patient hitters in baseball, maybe the most patient hitter in baseball, and a guy who'll make you pay if you make a mistake. In that lineup, like, that's, that's a formidable lineup. And then, you know, their pitching is good enough to carry him. So, yeah, I think that that's a tough team to beat. When you think of the three guys that San Diego is probably going to have at some point this season, Juan Soto, Manny Machado, Fernando Tatis Jr., pray for the pitchers in Major League Baseball that have to face that San Diego lineup. But the Padres still, Rob, not the favorites in the National League. The third best price at plus 490. The Dodgers remain the favorites at plus 165. And the Mets ahead of San Diego as well at plus 290. So following trade deadline day, Rob, how do you feel about the race for a National League pennant? You know, that's a great question because I think some of the teams that didn't make the monster moves are making monster moves by getting players back. Like you have the Dodgers now getting Dustin May back um, and adding, you know, Walker Bueller. So it's, and, and potentially Blake Trinan, who is supposed to be their closer coming into the year. So you have him potentially coming back as well. Um, you know, that team, they're basically upgrading through getting guys back. Same with the Mets getting DeGrom back. Like, like you're getting a Cy Young caliber pitcher every year back. It's almost, I mean, it's crazy. It wasn't an acquisition yesterday for the New York Mets, but it might have been the biggest move of the day. Jacob DeGrom making his return, his season debut in 2022. Now the Mets were booked as a minus 350 favorite against the soto -less Washington Nationals, and they still lost the game 5-1, to one, but that doesn't take away from what DeGrom did on the bump in his return, Rob. Five innings of work, only 59 pitches, only allowed one earn, on three hits, and struck out six Again, in only 59 pitches, still falling short of that K-prop at six and a half. What did you take away from DeGrom's debut yesterday? Well, I took away that he is still Jacob DeGrom. He had a 95-mile-an-hour slider and a 102-mile-an-hour fastball, was around the zone, throwing strikes. It kills me on the K-prop because all it was a matter of is him pitching a little longer. Um, yep. And then you also, like, it's, uh, you know, he pitches and the Mets lose. That's just what happens right like that's yeah. we've all come to expect that at this point that is the unfortunate reality at times despite how good Jacob deGrom is on the mound the run support for the Mets who had 19 hits on Sunday 13 hits on Monday and only able to muster up one run yesterday but still the optimism is very very high right now for the Mets the fourth best price Rob to win the World Series the Yankees are now the favorites moving past the Dodgers because LA's competition in the NL got more difficult yesterday with San Diego adding Juan Soto. And then there are the Astros rounding out the top three at plus 430. So this is the picture now following the deadline of what the World Series odds look like. Rob, in your estimation, you're trying to follow along with all of these trades. Who do you think had the best trade deadline out of these contenders for a World Series championship? I mean, well, the, the, the Padres had the, the biggest move, obviously. I think the Yankees adding Montas is a, is a huge deal. Um, you know, the Astros, don't forget, they're getting Lance McCullers Jr. back. Like, that mm -hmm. is, he is legit one of the top pitchers in the AL. So even if guys, even if teams didn't make your monster moves, don't forget, they're going to be improving. 
And, uh, you know, any team that adds Lance McCullers back is going to be improving. He is, he is electric. The Yankees add Frankie Montas. The Mariners add Luis Castillo. Luis Castillo will be up in the Bronx today against the pinstripes. I want to ask you about one other move, Rob, that San Diego made two days ago, acquiring Josh Hader, the all-star closer from the Milwaukee Brewers. It was a surprising move to see two teams in contention for the postseason make that swap. What do you evaluate when you look at Josh Hader? Because he's struggled a little bit here as of late, but do you still think he's a top five relief pitcher in all of Major League Baseball? Oh, without a doubt. Like, everybody's entitled to struggles. When you're a reliever, like we were talking about him being an all time great closer just uh, like a month ago. And then he has a couple of bad outings. Now it's like, yeah, I don't know if he's any good anymore. It's hard. Like, I get it. It goes like this, but he's still amazing. Like, Josh Hader is, is dominant. He is a force at the end of the, at, at the end of the bullpen. Like, he's, he's cash money. Like, I would love to have him on. Very significant for the Padres. Not only what they can bring on offense, but how they can close out games with an all-star now in Josh Hader. Rob, as we look at the World Series odds once again, were there any teams that you expected to see make more moves at the deadline that you think stayed maybe just a tad too quiet? You know, I think the White Sox stayed pretty quiet. They added Jake Diekman, which is a good, you know, Diekman can be really, really good. They didn't add much else. But, you know, the White Sox had been, I think, underperforming. If they start performing like they can, they're going to be a, a force. But I did expect them to make a little bit of a move there. Rob Freeman, the pitching ninja from FanDuel, joining us here on the morning after on the Wednesday following trade deadline day in the bigs yesterday. So, Rob, we have an idea of what the playoff picture looks like. The divisional front runners in both leagues and, of course, those teams that might have made some small moves to position themselves better in that postseason market in wild card spots. In the American League right now, the order is the Blue Jays, the Mariners, and the Rays. In the NL, it's the Braves, the Padres, and currently the Phillies occupy that uh, third and final wild card spot. Rob, of these teams in both leagues, who do you think can contend for a pennant and challenge some of those divisional favorites right now, like the Yankees, like the Astros in the AL, and the Dodgers certainly in the National League? Yeah, I would think, you know, the Mariners adding Castillo. Castillo can beat any pitcher in the major leagues. He's an ace, and having him on your team just makes you naturally better. Um, the Blue Jays are improving mostly because I think Barrios has finally figured it out. He pitched really well over the last month, and I expect them to now, you know, you might think they should have made a move for pitching, but I think he is their move for pitching. He's straightened his, he's straightened his stuff out. The Braves, you know, the Braves did some quality work again, not only locking up Riley for a million years, which yeah. helps improve team morale. Like he's a he's an amazing stud. Um, but you also added some pitching and adding Iglesias is like I think people just glossed over that. That is a quality closer who now gives you insurance and an extra bullpen arm and is dominant like he is at the you know, at the top of his game. He He's going to be yeah. a force. The Phils add Noah Syndergaard from the Angels, a starting pitcher to that staff, a reliever, a veteran one with tons of experience, and David Robertson from the Chicago Cubs, and the Phillies on the road today against their divisional opponents in the Atlanta Braves. A really good pitching matchup today in Atlanta, Rob, between Charlie Morton for the Braves and Zach Wheeler on the other side for the Phils. Atlanta booked as the home favorite, but how do you evaluate this pitching duel we could see today between Morton and Wheeler? You know, I mean, Wheeler is consistent, workhorse, and a dominant pitcher. I love watching him throw. And you have Charlie Morton, who could be up and down. Like, Charlie Morton, you know, it wouldn't surprise me to see him rack up, you know, 10 or more Ks. He can easily do that. Or he can have a bad outing. I mean, he's, he tends to have, like, that one bad inning that messes you up. Um, but he's still, like, he's still spinning the ball really well, throwing hard. So I expect a really good pitching matchup. And I, I would like to see Charlie Morton straighten it out and have one of those big Charlie Morton games. And we showed you the Braves in the National League pennant and their odds yesterday, plus 600, actually got better by 50 cents after all the deadline and all the deals shook out. It's plus 550. And Rob, you've been all over one of their young pitchers, Spencer Strider. Now the odds on favorite at minus 155 to win NL Rookie of the Year. How important will Strider be for the Braves in this postseason push? Oh, he's hugely important to me. And I don't say this lightly. 
I was trying to think back of a more electric Atlanta starting pitcher, and I'm going back to John Smoltz to say, like, Spencer Strider is that guy. There was a stat that of all rookies, Kerry Wood leads in all-time K per nine at like 12.6. Spencer Strider is at 13.8 right now, K per nine. He's that good. So, yeah, like I would, you know, you can throw him in against anybody. Dude doesn't get rattled. Electric 100 mile an hour fastball with a wicked slider. Love that dude. And he's got his, he's got his head together too. Like, dude knows himself better than almost anybody. And he's, he's so young. Like, it's amazing to watch that guy pitch. Very, very electric. The top spot in the National League wild card right now for Atlanta, only three and a half games behind the Mets for the top spot in the National League East. Quickly here, Rob, a guy that maybe was speculated to move a little bit at the deadline yesterday, but will remain in Anaheim for the rest of this year, Shohei Otani, of course, on the mound today against the A's. His K prop has just been posted on the FanDuel Sportsbook. It's eight and a half. Are we going over with Shohei on the bump today for the Angels? It's Shohei. I always go over. Like, the dude is a K machine. What does he have, like, six yeah. consecutive games of 10 strikeouts or more? It's got to end at some point. Hopefully not today. Let's see him get another one. Rob, we never want to be the gentleman that jump in front of the trend. If it stops, it stops. But we're not going <laughs> to predict that and try to fade Shohei Otani, right? The pitching ninja. Rob Absolutely. Freeman from FanDuel joining us here. Thanks so much for your time, Rob. Thanks, Ben. We round out the show with the National League Cy Young favorite. Also on the bump as well, Sandy Alcantara's cave prop is our best bet. Next. If you want to pick like a pro, you need to be in the know. The future of sports gaming is now, and we take you inside the lines, breaking down all the action and what it means for your bet slip. Turn down the game and tune into Sports Grid Radio. Other networks talk sports talk, but we walk the walk right up to the window. Sports Grid Radio. Listen free on the Sports Grid Radio app, iHeart, or tune in, or catch us on Sirius XM Sports Grid Channel 159. Maurice Allen, 2015-2016 European Long Drive Tour Champion, 2017 World Number One. Me personally, I keep my game face on me all the time. Especially coming out of the bunker, leaving the range, or even leaving the course. What's your story? The morning after. How do you evaluate Cleveland's team win total for 2022? You know, I start as we should with those six games. And you that is a lot of times you talk about win totals. That might paint the picture. If you feel like the Browns can go four and two in those six games, you're easily going to push the over, right? Because you're going to ask Deshaun Watson to go basically 500 in the games that he can play. And you assume he'll do better than that. I don't know about four and two. You know, I think three and three is certainly more optimistic. The Sports Grid Network. The Bostonian versus the book. This is a federal crime. He will lose his team. If there's any evidence, what you're telling me is, if there's any evidence, recording, email, or the like, that can show that this conversation happens, because clearly it happened. But I wasn't. I wasn't serious. The investigation clears that it happened. The conversation about throwing games to Brian Flores from the owner happened. The Bostonian versus the book. Fantasy Sports Today. So CJ Abrams was a former first round pick of the Padres. He could obviously play the infield, he could play the outfield. I think really the key name in this as far as the offensive future for the Padres is Robert Hassel III. James Wood, I believe, is also a top 20 prospect for the Padres. And the reason why it feels a little bit light is because the Padres are just like kind of getting Josh Bell as like a throw in. The Sports Grid Network. Pharrell, coast to coast. Syndergaard goes to the Philadelphia Phillies. So the Angels send Syndergaard back to the National League East, where, of course, Scotty, he will face his old team, the Mets, quite a bit. He will not start for the Angels tonight. A couple more that just went down. The Yankees send Jordan Montgomery to the St. Louis Cardinals. 
for outfielder Harrison Bader. Oh, uh, I love Bader. Bader to the game. The Sports Grid Network. Closing out our two hours together here, live on this Wednesday on Sports Grid and the morning after. Sirius XM, channel 159, the home for Sports Grid Radio on Sirius XM. All across the Sports Grid Network, I am Ben Stevens. Thank you for joining us here on this Wednesday, the day following the Major League Baseball trade deadline. The rosters are set. You know the guys in the clubhouse. You know what the final month plus of this Major League Baseball season is going to look like for the most part, teams that are in contention for the postseason, either a divisional crown or a wild card spot, and teams that might not be, but still have some of the best players in all of the bigs, including the odds on favorite, the front runner for the National League Cy Young Award. His name is Sandy Alcantara, and he gets the start today for the Marlins against the Cincinnati Reds. Minus 160, the price now on Alcantara to win the Cy Young Award on the FanDuel Sportsbook. But our focus is a K-prop. So before we say farewell, before we say goodbye, it's time for a Major League Baseball K-prop best bet. It is time for Bye Bye Bye. How do we find some value on Sandy Alcantara starting for the Marlins against the Cincinnati Reds? Miami right now, a minus 210 home favorite against Cincy with Sandy on the bump. We look at that K-prop. It's seven and a half for all contra right now. And here's the great thing about backing a K prop when Sandy gets the start. You know the volume is going to be there. You know that he is a guy that burns through pitches and burns through innings, most likely pitching more than 100 pitches throughout a Major League Baseball game. And the great thing here for Sandy with plus money to the over against the Reds, the Reds have the second highest K rate all year long against righties. It's more than 27%. It goes down a little bit since the All-Star break in these past two weeks, but still nearly 24.7, 25% that strikeout rate for Cincinnati against Riley. Sandy Alcantara, over seven and a half strikeouts, plus money to the over against Cincy today. The morning after, each and every weekday, live right here on SportsGrid. It starts at 9 a.m. Eastern time. I'm Ben Stevens, and we'll talk tomorrow. We have a football game tomorrow.